What is going on guys? Welcome to this video. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the theory behind neural networks in order to get an understanding of what a neural network is, how it's structured and how it basically works. So let us get into the explanation. Now let us start with the question of what a neural network actually is. A neural network is basically just a mathematical structure that solves problems in a machine learning world. So this could be a regression problem, a classification problem, a reinforcement learning problem. It doesn't matter if it's unsupervised, supervised, whatever. A neural network is used for multiple different things and they're highly used because they're so effective at problem solving. And uh, neural networks are consisting of so-called neurons. So this could be a neuron here and they are consisting of layers of neurons. So the first layer of neurons uh, in a neural network is called the input layer and it's followed by a bunch of so-called hidden layers. These hidden layers are basically layers in between the two outer layers. So they are also consisting of a bunch of neurons here. And in the end, we then have an output layer. And usually if you're using a, an ordinary feed forward neural network with dense layers, what you have is you have all the neurons of one layer connected to all the neurons of the next layer. So I'm not going to draw all the connections here right now, but you get the idea every neuron of one layer is connected to every neuron of the next layer. So all these neurons are interconnected. I'm not going to draw all of them now, just so that you get the idea, basically, you know, something like that. They're all interconnected. And this goes not only for the input layer and the hidden layers, it goes for all the layers. So they're all interconnected here, also for the output layer. So let's just write it down here. This is the output layer. And these here are the hidden layers. And the hidden layers are, come on, the hidden layers are just layers of uh, abstraction, layers of sophistication, because the only thing that we want is actually you want to put in some data and get some output. For example, if it's a classification problem, we want to put in an image, for example, of uh, some animal here. And what we want to get is we want to know, is it a cat or a dog? So it could say, okay, it's a cat or it's a dog, whatever it is. And it's basically a classification problem. In this case, we feed in information into the input layer and we want to get a result in the output layer. For example, this could be uh, the neuron indicating that's a cat and this could be the neuron indicating it's a dog and this could be uh, activated at 0 0.9 and this 0 0.1, which would tell us it's a 90% a cat. So this is how neural networks are used for classification, for example. And uh, these hidden layers in the middle are just what makes uh, the neural network think, you could say. So what we're looking at here is an ordinary feed-forward neural network. We're going to talk about the different types of neural networks in uh, another video. But this is an ordinary feed-forward neural network, which means that we have the direction, uh, the, the information is always fed into one direction. We're only feeding the information forward. We don't have any loops, for example, like this here or we don't have any backward connections where we feed the information back into the network. We just have feed forward from the input layer to the output layer through the hidden layers. And the hidden layers are what makes this model complex because this year is just input. This year is just output and everything in between are the interconnections that we can tweak, the parameters that we can change uh, in order to get the right prediction. So now let us take a look at the structure of an individual neuron. Now an individual neuron gets a lot of inputs from a previous layer. So the previous layer produces a bunch of outputs. The neurons of a previous layer produce a lot of outputs. And these outputs are then the input for our next layer here. So I1, I2, I3. And okay, this should be a three. Uh, and these inputs here are just numerical values. For example, they could be 0 0.3, they could be 0 0.7 and 0 0.9. Of course, they could also be 25, depending on the activation function that you use. We're going to talk about that in a second. But you have these values here, and these values are now being weighted. So each connection into our neuron has a certain weight, uh, W1, W2, and W3. So these are the weights, and these weights indicate how important uh, these particular things are. So we could say that uh, weight 1 is 5, for example, and this would mean that we multiply 0 0.3 times 5. So we have, uh, in this case, 1.5 as a final output that comes into the neuron. Then we have uh, 0 0.7, let's say this is 0 0.5, and this would mean it's half of it, so 0 0.35. 
And then we have 0 0.9 and the weight could be just 2 and this would produce 1.8. So these are the final inputs that come into our uh, neuron and what we now do with them is we feed them into a transformation function which is actually just summing them up. So we calculate the sum of those. Uh, I don't want to do the calculation right now. Let's just say it's roughly 4. And uh, what we do then is we subtract a so-called bias. So we have a certain bias here, and this bias is a constant value that we subtract. For example, it could be three, three, and we then subtract this bias from the sum. So we say four minus three, and this is one. And then, this is the final output of this transformation here. What we do then is we feed this into one more thing called the activation function. This activation function takes this input and produces a final output. So activation function. So we take this one here and feed it into the function. So in this case, uh, the function could be a sigmoid function. I don't know what the exact value of one would be. Zero is like 0 0.5. So one is probably, I don't know, uh, 0 0.6, around 0 0.6. Let's say it's just that. Um, and this is then the final output. So 0 0.6 is the final output of this neuron which is again, let me pick another number here, the input for another neuron in the next layer. So this 0 0.6 here is the I1 for the next neuron, for example. So this is how it works. Let me repeat it one more time. You get some inputs, then you have the weights for the connections here. So we get some numerical value multiplied time the weight, times the weight. You do this for all the connections entering a neuron. Then what you do is you sum all these values up subtract a certain bias, feed the result of this calculation into a certain activation function. Uh, we're going to talk about activation functions in a second, what uh, kind of activation functions there are. But basically, you just take some activation function, you feed in the final result of this calculation, then you get the final result, the output of this neural network, uh, of this uh, neuron, sorry, not of the whole neural network. Now, one thing that is important is, you don't choose the weights and biases yourself. You don't, as a programmer, you don't define the weights and biases of a neuron. What we do is we let the neuron figure out using gradient descent and backpropagation, we're going to talk about that in a second. We're letting the neural network figure out what values are best for producing the desired results. So we're training the neural network, we're finding out, okay, um, how can we find the best weights and biases so that you always produce the result that we want. Uh, in the case of cats and dog images, you're feeding in the pixels, you're showing him, okay, this is a, um, showing it, this is a dog, this is a cat. And what you want is you want the neural network to tweak the weights and biases so that it always produces the right results. This is what we're trying to do here, and this is the structure of a basic neuron. Now let us take a look at two activation functions in order to get an understanding of what's happening when we're using an activation function and what they look like. So before we do that, let's just talk about how an activation could be done. You could say this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. Um, as long as I get an input x, which is below zero, I always return zero. And as soon as I get an input over zero, above zero, I return one. So this is what the basic perceptron does, but the perceptron is very outdated and not used because this version of uh, an activation function, so to say, uh, is pretty limited. So what you do here is you basically say, okay, if it's 0 0.0001, it's a 1, but if it's minus 0 0.001, it's a 0. And it's very limited and very static, so very binary, very black and white, so we have activation functions that uh, do this in a much better way. So let us take a look at the sigmoid activation function. We're not getting too mathematical here, but I'm going to write down the function so that you get an intuition. The sigmoid function is basically sigma of x equals, I'm going to write it, oh, actually we have enough space here, one over one plus e to the power of minus x. Now you don't need to memorize this, you don't need to know this when you're programming, you're just typing in sigmoid activation function, but this function is a little bit smoother than the basic perceptron. So what we're doing here is we're basically, I hope I don't do this too shitty here. Uh, don't take it too seriously what I'm drawing here because it's not perfect. Let me redraw this actually. So basically you're having a 
smooth version, oh, that's actually quite good, uh, of the perceptron. So you're having the one value here. So this is the limit, this is the one, and this of course is the zero. And whatever we input into the sigmoid function, it returns a certain value between zero and one. So if we get a large negative value, so minus 9,999, this would return almost zero. It will never reach zero actually, but it will return uh, 0 0.001 or something, I don't know. The same goes for uh, a large positive number, for example, 9,999, this would return something that's almost one, so 0 0.99999 and so on. Um, but the good thing is that you don't get the big jump from zero to one if you just pass the zero mark, because if you have, um, I don't know, let's say minus 0 0.01, this should be around, uh, I think, 0 0.49 or something. Uh, as soon as you get to zero, you get 0 0.5. And as soon as you get to 0 0.1, you get uh, 0 0.5001 or something, I don't know. Uh, but it's a much smoother way of uh, giving you an output for a given input instead of just saying uh, either 0 or 1. We have a big jump there. So this is one function that's very popular in machine learning. It's called the sigmoid function. It's much better than the basic perceptron. But there's actually one more activation function that is even more frequently used than the sigmoid function, and this is the relu function. And it's used because it's so super simple. The ReLU stands for rectified, rectified linear unit. And this function is super simple but super effective because what it actually does is as long as you give it a negative input, it will always return zero. And as soon as you give it a positive output, it will just return a positive input. It will just return the input as an output. So basically, uh, if you pass zero, it gives you zero. If you pass minus five, it gives you zero. If you pass minus 999, it gives you zero. If you pass five, it returns five. If you pass seven, it returns seven and so on. So you have this smooth increase, but still you don't allow for negative values, which is very useful because negative values might lead to a lot of confusion in a neural network. So you usually want to avoid them, but still you have the gradual scale of values uh, based on the input. So one produces one and so on. So uh, the function written down is just f of x equals max of zero and x. So if x is less than zero, we return zero. And if x is uh, more than zero or greater than zero, we return x. Very simple function, very useful. And we're using it uh, a lot of times, actually in a lot of projects, I've already used a relo. And in future projects, we're also going to use relo. So this function is very important. So now we're going to talk about a very fundamental concept of machine learning, which is called training and testing. So if you know something about machine learning, you probably know what training and testing is, but I'm going to explain it very quickly here because it's very essential for the next topic we're going to talk about, which is gradient descent and uh, backpropagation. So you have a machine learning model. This doesn't have to be a neural network. In this case, it is a neural network, but it could also be a support vector classifier. It could be a K. Uh, nearest neighbors classifier, whatever, you have a machine learning model and what you want to do is you want to input some data and you want this model to output the right data. Now this could be anything. This could be a breast cancer classification, this could be a handwritten digit recognition, this could be a uh, voice recognition, this could be whatever you want. Uh, in this case we're again going to take the example of images of cats and dogs. So we feed it in, we feed in images of animals and what we want to do is we want the neural network to predict if this is a cat or to recognize if this is a cat or a dog. So this is the goal with this uh, particular machine learning model. And in order to make it do that, we need the model to adjust its weight and biases, weights and biases. We're going to talk about how it does that in a second. But when we're training the model, what we're doing is we're providing some labeled data, at least when we're dealing with supervised uh, learning and classifications, we're providing training data, which um, could be something like 50,000 images of cats and dogs with classifications. So we could say, okay, this image here is a cat, the next one is a cat as well, the next one is a dog and so on. And what we do is we feed all of these images into our neural network and we tell it afterwards, okay, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is again a dog, 
this is a cat and so on. And the neural network should then adjust its weights and biases so that we uh, so that it learns what a cat looks like and what a dog, a dog looks like. So this is how we train the model. Now, what we do afterwards, once the model is trained, is we test it. So we say, I have, uh, I don't know, 5,000 more images of cats and dogs. And I'm going to use these images to test them all. Now, these are images that our model has never seen before. It's not um, the training data. It's completely uh, new images. And what we do is we just feed these images into the a machine learning model without telling it that this is a cat or a dog. We just see what it says. And at the same time, however, the data is still labeled and we know if it's a cat or a dog. So we just compare the output of the neural network with the actual result. And we say, okay, yes, this is true or no, this is not true. And based on that, we calculate the so-called error. I'm going to use a red number, a uh, red color here. The error is basically how much percent of the class uh, of the training examples, uh, sorry, of the testing examples were classified incorrectly. So an error could be 10% and these 10% would indicate that 90% of the images were classified correctly and 10% not. Now there's a second metric that's even more important for the computer, which is the loss metric. And the loss metric is calculated with the so-called loss function. And it's a numerical value that it's not that it's not that intuitive for, uh, for us humans. So this could be something like 2.91 or 5.6 or 0 0.7. Now this is not a percentage of how many um, of how many examples were lost or how much the error is, but it's just a metric that is calculated by a specific loss function. Now for us humans, it's more intuitive to look at the error in order to realize okay how much percent of the model was classified incorrectly or how much percent of the training uh, testing examples were classified incorrectly by our model. But the loss function is actually what we want to minimize because the error is better for us humans, but the computer can better work with a loss function. So our goal is when using gradient descent and backpropagation is to minimize the loss function. We want to get it as low as it can get because a lower loss means that the model is more accurate. So the goal is minimize the loss function. This is what we do with the gradient descent algorithm. So now let's talk about the gradient descent algorithm. Now, before we start here, I want to mention that I'm not going too deep into the mathematics here. I'm not going to explain exactly with calculus and partial derivatives how the gradient descent algorithm works. The only thing that I want to do here is I want to give you an intuition of how this works. Maybe I'm going to do a mathematical series in the future where I tell you or where I teach you how uh, these processes and algorithms work in detail, but now we're just getting an intuition here. So what the gradient descent algorithm does, gradient descent, is it tries to minimize a given function. So let's say we have a simple function here, or actually the output of the function. Uh, let's say we have a very, very simple function here, which is just this one here. This could be something like x squared plus one, for example. And what the gradient descent algorithm does is it starts at a certain point. So let's say it starts here. This is the x axis, which is the input and the y axis is the output. And now what you need to imagine here, this is just two dimensions. So it's very, very, very simplified. But actually what we have here is x, which could be the weight and the bias or the weights and the biases. And y is the output of the loss function. So we give it the x, which is the collection of weights and biases, and the y is the loss function. So what we do is with the current weights and biases, we have a certain loss. We have a certain y value. This could be 7, for example. And what we want to do is we want to minimize it as much as possible. Now, as you can see, we're not going, we're not going to reach 0 at the loss function. We want to get to the local minimum. We want to get to the minimum of this function, which is right here. So in order to get there, what we need to do is we need to move the x value. And in this case, as you can see, we need to move it to the right because when we move the x value to the right, when we increase the x value, we decrease the y value. So what we do is we basically make a tiny step into the, uh, into the right direction so that the y value gets lower. So in the next step or after this step, we have a value of 6.5, for example. And we continue to do this over and over again until we reach the minimum. And this could be one, or in this case, it is one. So this is basically what the gradient descent algorithm does. It picks a point and it then uh, tries to 
to get it into the local minimum. Now, how does it do that? Uh, as I said, I'm not going to get too deep, in, deep into the mathematics here, but basically we're calculating the direction of the steepest descent. We're calculating the derivative, uh, the partial derivative of x in, or for x in this case, and we're finding out the best way to increase the function, and then we're just taking a tiny step into the opposite direction as long um, as this is a positive number, that the gradient is a positive number, because when the gradient is zero, we know that we've reached a valley, a local minimum, so to say. Now, this might be a problem when we're using more complex functions, uh, because of course, uh, this function was very simple, but what happens if we have a function that looks like this here? As you can see, I mean, this is a ridiculous function right now, don't take it too seriously, but if I start here, for example, with the gradient descent algorithm, I will end up here in the local minimum, whereas the function minimum, in this case, at least what we see here, the total minimum would be here. So we can go much, much lower than the local minimum here. And this is the problem, or not the problem, but the limitation of the gradient descent algorithm. It's not going to find the minimum of the function. It's going to find the local minimum. So it's going to say, okay, from the starting point, the local minimum, the local value is this one here. But yeah, there are a couple of points in this function here that are lower than this particular minimum here. So this is the limitation of gradient descent and we need to be aware of it. Now there's one more thing that needs to be taken into account here. When we're working with neural networks, we're not working with an X axis and a Y axis. We have one loss value, but we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of inputs. These are weights, biases. We have so many neurons each of those neurons have interconnections and we have weights and biases, so, so many of them. We have thousands and hundreds of thousands of them. So in this case, I just used a three-dimensional graph here to show you what happens when you have two dimensions uh, in order to give you a little understanding or intuition of what could happen. It's, it's not uh, possible to imagine it, but what would happen if you're dealing with uh, 500,000 dimensions, for example. So this would be the z-axis here, this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, and the z could be the loss, and x and y are the inputs, weights and biases, you could say. And we start at this point d here, and we want to get to this local minimum, which is somewhere here. So in this case, we're not just looking at x, we're looking at x and y. So we need to calculate the partial derivative. Again, I'm not going to explain it too much. Uh, don't worry, but basically we're looking at the x direction, in which direction do I need to move in order to decrease z the most, so we're calculating the partial derivative of x uh, in, in relation to z, or to f of x, whatever. Um, so in this case, you know, you need to go into that direction, or actually, you know, when you calculate the partial derivative, you calculate the direction of steepest descent, so in this case this one, and for y it's this one, and then you calculate, based on these two directions, you calculate uh, the direction of steepest descent, which is the total direction of steepest descent, could be something like that, and then you take a tiny, tiny step into the opposite direction. We're not talking about a big step, we're talking about a very, very, very tiny step, um, and then you repeat the process over and over again until you inevitably roll into the local value or the local minimum. This happens when you have two dimensions, and when you have 5,000 dimensions, you need to calculate for each of those 5,000 dimensions the best direction to take, then to calculate the best total direction to take, and then take a tiny step over and over again. This is what the gradient descent algorithm does, and it gets quite complicated when we're dealing with neural networks. So last but not least, we're going to talk about backpropagation, and backpropagation might seem a little bit confusing. Uh, and we're not going to get into the mathematical formulas here as well. We're just going to talk about the basic idea, the basic intuition of what is happening behind the scenes when backpropagation is used. So basically you have a neural network. Uh, let's pick the input layers here. Let's pick the hidden layers here. Um, very ugly drawing, I know, doesn't matter. But these are all interconnected here and whatever. And in the end, you end up with a certain result. So you give it an input and you get a certain output. For example, this could be the indicator for cat, this could be the indicator for dog, and the output of our neural network is 0 0.7 for cat and 0 0.3 for dog. And what we do here is we get this percentage here, so 70% likelihood that it's a cat, 
and 30% like likelihood that it's a dog. And then we compare it to the actual result when we're training. So the actual result could be one and zero because it's 100% a cat. If you know the result, it's 100% a cat. It's not like 99% a cat, it's 100% a cat. And it's 0% a dog. So this is what the neural network gets to see. And it will then know, okay, I need to increase this value, this value, and I need to decrease this value here. So this is what the neural network now knows that it has to do. But of course, you cannot just go ahead and change this value. You cannot just change the output of a neuron. The only thing that you can do is you can change the weights and the biases. You cannot change anything else. You cannot change the output or input in any way. So what you do is you basically go back a layer and you say, okay, looking at this output and how it needs to change, what needs to change in the previous layer? So for example, this neuron here, if I increase it, would it increase this neuron and decrease this neuron? If yes, okay, I need to increase this neuron because this neuron increases this one and decreases this one. Uh, then maybe I realize, okay, this neuron here radically decreases this one and slightly increases this one, uh, which is, you know, in the middle of what we want. But since it radically decreases this one, we probably want to decrease it a little bit. And you proceed like that over and over again. So you say, okay, this one also needs to be decreased for our desired result. And the last one needs to be increased a lot, whatever. And then what you do is you go back one more layer. And then you see, okay, in order to increase this one, decrease this one, decrease this one, and increase this one, uh, maybe you end up uh, with the solution that you need to decrease these three and increase the last one. And then you do this until you reach the input layer. And then basically based on these results, you know, okay, for this particular training example, I need to increase or decrease the outputs uh, of these individual neurons. And based on that, you can adjust weights and biases. Now, the problem is that all of this that we did right now is just for one training example. So then after that, you get a second training example. And this training example might demand a totally different uh, way of increasing or decreasing the outputs. For example, uh, I might feed in another uh, image of a cat, but in this case, it was a very bad output, for example, like this. Um, and this will demand a much higher increase in the cat neuron and a much higher decrease in the dog neuron. And also the other way around, maybe I have a dog and it's wrongly classified, so I will need to do the exact opposite of all that. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to compare output to input and see how you want to change the individual activations of the neurons. And based on that, you're going to um, adjust weights and biases. And of course, for example, let's just uh, look at this particular neuron here. The first one wanted to increase it. The second one wanted to increase it even more. Then the third one wanted to decrease it and so on. In the end, what you need to do is you need to combine all of these results, all of these uh, desired increases and decreases to end up with an average result of an average demand. So you could say, okay, most of them want to decrease it. Uh, a couple of them want to increase it. So you'll end up with a slight decrease. Whereas if all of them or almost all of them want to decrease it, you'll end up with a huge decrease. This is how it basically works. Uh, very superficial. Again, don't take it uh, too seriously here. But this is the intuition and the idea of how backpropagation basically works. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If you like this type of theoretical videos, let me know in the comment section down below and hit the like button so that I know that you like these videos. Um, also, feel free to ask questions and give feedback in the comment section down below and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done yet because you'll see more future videos for free. So thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.